Chapter Five of What the White Race May Learn from the Indian by George Wharton James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Five, The Indian and Sleeping Out of Doors. As I have already intimated, the Indian is practically an out-of-door sleeper. I say practically, for there are exceptions to the general rule. The Hopis of northern Arizona have houses. In the cold winter months they sleep indoors whenever they can. The Navajos, Apaches, Avasupai, and other tribes have their hogans and hawas in which they sleep in the very cold weather. But in the summer the invariable rule is for all to sleep out of doors. And even in the winter, if duty calls them away from home, and they have to camp out, they sleep in the cold, on the snow, in the rain, as unconcerned for their health as if they were well protected indoors. It is this latter feature that so much commends itself to me. It is just as natural to them to have to sleep out of doors as it is to sleep indoors. They think no more of it, do not regard it as an unusual and dangerous experience or one to be dreaded. They accept it without a murmur or complaint and without fear. This is an attitude of mind that I would the white race would learn from the Indian. I once had a friend, a city-bred man, born and brought up in New York, sent west to me by his physician because he had had two or three hemorrhages, whom I took out into Arizona. The first night we had to sleep out was very cold, for it was early in the year, and at that high altitude the thermometer sank very rapidly after the sun went down. Yet I deliberately called camp by the side of a great snowbank. The fearful invalid wanted to know what I was stopping there for. I told him it was to afford him a good sleeping place on the snow. He expressed his dread, and assured me that such an experience would kill him at once. I told him that if it did, I would see that he was decently buried, but that did not seem to dissipate his fears. After a good campfire was built, and he had had a warm and comforting supper, and his blankets were stretched out on the snow, and he was undressed and well wrapped up, with a hot rock at his feet, and the cheery blaze lighting up the scene, he felt less alarmed. I talked him to sleep, and when he awoke in the morning it was to confess that his throat and lungs felt more comfortable than they had done for many long months. A month of this open-air sleeping gave him new ideas on the subject, and sent him back east to fit up a camp in the Adirondacks, where he could get a great deal of outdoor life and sleeping with doors and windows wide open. The outdoor treatment for tuberculosis is now almost universal. Here is what one eminent authority says on the subject. Tuberculosis is a direct result of overwork, either mental or physical, and rest is largely its cure. This life in the open air is best carried out in a sitting or semi-reclining posture. Every hour of the day in all seasons of the year and in all kinds of weather should thus be spent, together with sleeping in a tent, protected veranda, or in a house with windows wide open. It will be found that the colder the weather, the more marked and permanent the results. One does not need to be uncomfortable. One can be well wrapped with heavy blankets. It is the inhalation of cold air that is so effectual in stimulating appetite as a general tonic and fever reducer. A consumptive should have for his motto, Every hour in the closed house is an hour lost. There is no excuse for losing time. But it is not for those who are in ill health alone that I would commend out-of-door sleeping. Those who are healthy need to be kept in health, and there is a vim, a vigor, a physical joy, 
comes from this habit that i would that every child young man and woman and adult in the land might enjoy here is what one intelligent writer mary heath has recently said upon this subject and her words i most heartily endorse the success of any scheme for human betterment morally mentally or physically depends upon securing human cooperation by convincing the intellect of the truth or falsity of any widespread belief the almost universal notion that night air is dangerous has predisposed more than any other one cause to the shutting of every door and window at sunset to keep out malaria notwithstanding the fact that all air analyses show that outdoor night air is much purer than day air the old fear of night air still remains and is responsible for much infection from foul air because outdoor and indoor workers in summer and winter all alike spend their sleeping hours in ill-ventilated bedrooms after false ideas about the harmfulness of fresh air are eradicated plans should be devised and utilized for arranging outdoor sleeping apartments plans should also be devised for keeping the body warm in cold weather without an over amount of bed clothing and for the health and convenience of the millions of middle class and more or less humble domestic home workers provisions should be made for doing the housework as much as possible out of doors away from the kitchen heat and odors of cooking food out-of-door recreation for the family should also be provided for could all sedentary workers spend the seven to nine hours of sleep in a clean outdoor atmosphere many of the evil effects of indoor sedentary work would be neutralized the shop office or factory employee after sleeping in the pure night air would awake invigorated for the day's demands and duties beginning the day aright with a keen normal appetite for healthful food he would be able to utilize his working energies without either structural damage to the tissues or intellectual or moral degradation albert hubbard of roycroft fame has converted all the sleeping rooms of his phalanstery into outdoor rooms where fresh pure air is breathed dr kellogg editor of good health sleeps out of doors all the time and all his large family of adopted children have rooms which practically contain no doors or windows so that they sleep as near the open air as civilization will allow for years as far as was possible i have slept out of doors when at home my bed is on an open porch my face turned to the stars the waving of plum peach and fig trees making music while i sleep the beautiful lights of earliest dawn cheering my eyes before i arise and the twittering and singing of the birds putting melodies into my soul as i dress when i am in the wilds exploring i sleep out of doors always when and where i can those who have read my various books know of my experience of sleeping in storms during heavy rains without bedding in rocky washes in leaky boats and the rain pouring upon us in the heat of the desert and the cold of the snowy plateaus of arizona yet i do not remember that i ever once took cold though i have been wet through many a night on the other hand i never visit civilization especially the proud haughty conceited civilization of the east where houses are steam heated and street and railway cars are superheated without taking severe colds and suffering much misery those who have heard nansen and peary and other arctic explorers will remember that they had the same experience is it not apparent therefore that the outdoor life is the normal the healthful the rational the natural life while that of the steam-heated house is abnormal unhealthful 
irrational and unnatural? People often say, but I see that my house is well ventilated, and therefore the air is as pure and good as it is out of doors. In reply, permit me to say that no house can ever be well ventilated. Air to be pure and wholesome must be alive. It can only live when free and uncontained, and in contact with the direct rays of the sun during the day. Every thoughtful person has noticed the great difference there is between outdoor air and indoor air on stepping from outside inside, even though all the doors and windows of the room were wide open. There is a vast difference between indoor and outdoor air, even under the best of conditions. So get into the open all you can, day or night, winter or summer, wet or dry. One of the finest and strongest poems in the language is the following by Richard Burton. God's Gift, the Air Now, is there anything that freer seems than air, the fresh, the vital, that a man draws in with breathings bountiful, nor dreams of any better bliss, because he can make over all his blood thereby, and feel once more his youth return, his muscles steel, and life grow buoyant, part of God's good plan. Oh, how on plain and mountain and by streams that shine along their path, or many a field proud with pied flowers, or where sunrise gleams in spangled splendors, does the rich air yield its balsam. Yea, how hunter, pioneer, lover, and bard have felt that heaven was near because of the air their spirit touched and healed. And yet, God of the open, look and see the millions of thy creatures pent within close places that are foul for one clean breath. Thrilling with health and hope and purity, nature's vast antidote for stain and sin life's sweetest medicine this side of death how comes it that this largesse of the sky thy children lack of till they drop and die many white people go out tenting in the summer and think they are sleeping out of doors what a foolish error here is what a scientific authority says upon the subject are you tenting if so, you should know that a well-closed tent is nearly airtight, and consequently that in an ordinary-sized tent one occupant will so pollute the air as to render it unfit to breathe in less than twenty minutes, two occupants in less than ten minutes, that if you are tenting for your health, an opening at each end of the tent must be provided for ventilation at night. The openings should be at least a foot square for each occupant. Breathing impure air lowers the vitality and consequently renders one susceptible to colds and other diseased conditions. End of chapter 5「Chapter Six of What the White Race May Learn from the Indian by George Wharton James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Six The Indian as a Walker, Rider, and Climber. As a part of his out of door life, the Indian is a great walker and runner, having horses, he is a great rider and living in a mountainous or canyon region, he is a great climber. The Indian walks through necessity, and also through delight and joy. He knows to the full the joy of mere living. A few miles' walk, more or less, is nothing to him, and he does it so easily that one can see he enjoys it. In one of my books, I tell the story of the running powers of the Hopi Indians of northern Arizona. It is worth quoting here. The Indians of the Painted Desert Region, Little Brown and Company, Boston, Illustrated, $2 net, 20 cents postage. 
it is no uncommon thing for an Orebi or Mashaganavi to run from his home to Monkopi, a distance of forty miles, over the hot blazing sands of a real American Sahara, there hoe his cornfield and return to his home within twenty-four hours. I once photographed, the morning after his return, an old man who had made this eighty-mile run and he showed not the slightest trace of fatigue. For a dollar I have several times engaged a young man to take a message from Orebi to Keems Canyon, a distance of seventy-two miles, and he has run on foot the whole distance, delivering his message, and brought me an answer within thirty-six hours. One Orebi, Kuwa Wen Tiwa, ran from Orebi to Monkopi, thence to Walpi, and back to Arabi, a distance of over ninety miles in one day. I doubt not that most of my readers suppose that these experiences are rare and unusual, and come after special training. Not at all. They are regular occurrences, made without any thought that the white man was either watching or recording. When asked for the facts, the Indians gave them as simply and unconcernedly as we might tell of a friend met or a dinner eaten. And it is not with one tribe alone. I have found the same endurance with Yumas, Pimas, Apaches, Navajos, Avasupai, Wallapais, Chimawavis, Utes, Paiutes, and Mojaves. Indeed, on the trackless wastes of the Colorado Desert, the Mojaves and Yumas perhaps show a greater endurance than any people I have ever seen. As a horseback rider, the Indian can teach many things to the white race. Among the Navajos and Hopis, the Havasupais and Wallapais, the Pimas and Apaches, most of the children are taught to ride at an early age. They can catch, bridle, and saddle their own horses while they are still little tots, and the way they ride is almost a marvel. There need be no wonder at this, for their mothers are as used to horseback riding as they are. Many an Indian child has come near to being born on horseback. They ride up and down trails, over the plains, and up the mountains. They go with their parents gathering the seeds and pinion nuts, and are also taught to handle their horses in the chase. They study horse nature, and early become expert horse breakers. While their animals are broncos and wild, and therefore are never as well broken as are ours, they compel them to every duty, and ride them fearlessly and constantly. The girls and women, too, ride almost as much as the boys and men and always astride. If anything were needed to demonstrate to an Indian woman the inferiority of a white woman, it would be that she sits on a side saddle. The utter unnaturalness and folly of such a posture is so incomprehensible to the Indian mind that she throws up her hands, figuratively speaking, and gives up the problem of solving the peculiar mentality of her white sister and I don't wonder. Thank God the day is passing when women are ashamed of having legs, or of placing one of them on one side and the other on the other side of a horse. Common sense and comfort will ultimately prevail and place the most modest, refined, cultured, and womanly women upon the backs of their horses, cavalier fashion, dressed in trousers, the idea that men should dictate to women what they should do to be womanly is so absurd as to make even fools laugh. What does a man know as to what is womanly? Women alone can determine that question, just as men alone must determine what is manly. So I am satisfied that I shall live to see womanly women, the best the world has, reasonably natural in their dress on horseback, and riding as the Creator evidently intended them to do. 
if girls as well as boys of the white race were to ride horseback more much disease would flee away liver and stomach troubles are shaken out of existence on horseback the blue devils and constipation are almost an impossibility and the exhilaration of the swift motion of the vivifying influence of the deeper breathing the shaking up of the muscles and nerves the quickening effect of the accelerated heart action and the readier circulation of well oxygenated blood makes the whole body a tingle with a newness of life that is glorious if i were well to do and had a score of children their chief education should be out of doors and rain or shine storm or calm snow or sleet winter or summer boys and girls alike should ride horseback ten to twenty miles or more each day nor should this do away with daily walking walking is a fine offset to riding one needs to walk a good deal to enjoy riding a good deal one is a necessary complement to the other one exercise uses muscles that are little called upon by the other so i would make good walkers in all weathers of all boys girls men and women of the white race even as are those of the indian race in order to be good walkers the indians have naturally found the most perfect and natural attitude for walking every indian walks upright his abdomen in chest up chin down and spinal column easily carrying his body and arms the white race may well learn from the indian how to keep the spinal column upright how to have a graceful carriage in walking and how to cure stooped shoulders with all younger women and men of all ages among the indians a curved spine ungraceful walk and stooped shoulders are practically unknown the women produce this result by carrying burdens upon their heads yes and the boys and men as well carry burdens also upon the head though not as much as the women burden carrying upon the head is a good thing as one writer has well said most of us are accustomed to regard the head as a mere thinking machine unconscious of the fact that this bony superstructure seems to have been specially adapted by nature to the carrying of heavy weights the arms are usually considered as the means intended for the bearing of burdens but the effect of carrying heavy articles in the hands or on the arms is very injurious and altogether destructive of an erect or graceful carriage the shoulders are dragged forward the back loses its natural curve the lungs are compressed and internal organs displaced when the head bears the weight of the burden as it is made to do among the peasant women of italy mexico and spain and the people of the far east there is a great gain in both health and beauty the muscles of the neck are strengthened the spine held erect the chest raised and expanded so that breathing is full and deep and the shoulders are held back in their natural positions it is a good thing for children to be early accustomed to the carrying of various articles gradually increasing in weight balanced upon the head in this way they may acquire an erect carriage and free and graceful walk the indian man and woman will pick up an olla of water containing a gallon or more and swinging it easily to the top of the head will walk along with hands by their sides as unconcernedly as if they carried no fragile bowl balanced and ready to fall at the slightest provocation and they will climb up steep and difficult trails still balancing the jar upon the head the effect of this is to compel a natural and dignified carriage i know navajo hopi and havasupai women 
who walk with a simple dignity that is not surpassed in drawing-room of president or king then too another reason for this dignified healthfully erect carriage is found in the fact that neither men nor women wear high-heeled shoes the moccasin is always flat and therefore the foot of the indian rests firmly and securely upon the floor no doubt if the indian woman wished to imitate the forward motion of the kangaroo or any other frivolous creature she could tilt herself in an unnatural and absurd position by high-heeled shoes but in all my twenty-five years of association with them i never found one foolish enough to do so the men as well as the women gain this upright attitude as the result of holding up their vital organs when they go for their long hunting and other tramps it seems to me that fully one-half the white men and women we meet on the streets are suffering from prolapsus of the transverse colon this is evidenced by the projection of the abdomen which generally grows larger as they grow older so that we have tailors for fat men and special implements of torture for compressing into what we call a decent shape the embonpoint of women but i ask as i see the indians why do white people have this paunch an indian with a bay window stomach a paunch is seldom if ever seen why he has long ago learned the art the necessity of keeping his abdominal muscles stretched tight his belly is always held in the muscles across his abdomen are like steel the result is the transverse colon is held securely in position it has no prolapse hence there is no paunch if we taught ourselves as the indian does to draw in the abdomen and at the same time breathe long and deep this prolapsus would be practically impossible half the medicine that is sold to so-called kidney sufferers is sold to people whose kidneys are no more diseased than are those of the man in the moon it is the pulling and tugging of the falling colon that causes the wearisome backache and the lying and scoundrelous wretches who prey upon the ignorant write out their catchpenny advertisements describing these feelings so that when the sufferer picks up their literature he is as good as entrapped for a dozen or more bottles or until his money gives out oh men and women of america learn to walk upright as god intended you should do not become chesty by throwing out your chest and throwing your shoulders back at the expense of your spine but pull in the muscles of your abdomen fill your lungs with air then pull your chin down and in and you will soon have three great grand and glorious blessings viz a dignified upright carriage freedom from and reasonable assurance that you will never have prolapsus of the transverse colon and its attendant miseries and backache and a lung capacity that will help you withstand the approaches of disease should you ever in some way come under its malign influence when i see white boys slouching and shambling along the streets i wish with a great wish that i could have them put under the training of some of my wild indian friends they would soon brace up heads would be held erect chins down abdomen in chest up and with lips closed and the pure air of the mountain canyon plain desert or forest entering their lungs through the nostrils the whole aspect of life would begin to change for nothing lifts up the spirit so much as just to lift the chest up it takes a load off the head off the mind off the heart raise your chest so high that the abdominal organs perform their functions in a proper way 
when one is all doubled over, the head and spine are deprived of blood that they are entitled to. When the chest is lifted up, the abdominal organs are compressed, and the blood that has been retired from the circulation and accumulated in the liver and the stomach is forced back into the current where it belongs. The head and spinal cord get their proper supply of blood, and one feels refreshed and energized immediately. But in addition to their walking and riding, the Indians are great climbers of steep canyon and mountain trails. Men, women, and children alike pass up and down these trails with almost the ease and agility of the goat. I have seen a woman with a cothic, a carrying basket, suspended from her forehead containing a load of fruit, of pine nuts, of grass seeds, weighing not less than from fifty to a hundred pounds her baby perched on top of the load, steadily and easily climb a trail that made me puff and blow like a grampus. Few exercises, properly taken, are of greater benefit to the lungs and heart, and indeed all the vital organs, than is trail or mountain climbing. See that your clothing is easy, especially around the waist for there must be room for every effort of lung expansion. This applies to men as well as to women, for the wretched and injurious habit is growing among men of wearing a belt instead of suspenders. If the prospective climber is a woman, let her wear a loose, light dress, and with as short a skirt as her common sense, judgment, and conscience will allow her to wear. If she is out in the wilds, let her wear trousers, and discard skirts entirely, as a senseless and barbarous slavery to custom and convention. Shoes should be easy and comfortable, with thick soles and broad, low heels. Begin to climb as early in the morning as possible. Don't try to do too much at first. Try a small hill conquer that by degrees. Get so that you can finally go up and down without any great effort. Then tackle the higher hills, and finally try real mountains, eight, ten, fourteen thousand feet high. If you are delicate to begin with, be more careful still, and ask the advice of your physician. But don't be afraid so long as you do not get fatigued to exhaustion for climbing develops the thighs and calves of the leg, the muscles of the back, enlarges the lungs, makes the heart pump more and purer, because better oxygenated, blood throughout the whole body, brings about more rapid changes in the material of the body, and thus exchanges old and useless tissues for new and healthy, dissolves and dissipates fat, induces perspiration and exhalations through the kidneys that are peculiarly beneficial. In breathing, be sure to keep the mouth closed. Insist upon nasal breathing, and the exercise will perforce make it deep breathing. The deeper you breathe, the more good you will get from it. Let the posture be correct, or you will lose much good. This is in brief. Pull the abdomen in, raise the chest, keep the chin down, and let the arms hang easily and naturally by the side. For years I have compelled myself to seize every possible opportunity for trail climbing or descending. Hundreds of miles of trails have I gone up and down in the Grand Canyon of Arizona, often with a thirty, forty, fifty-pound camera and food supplies on my back. I have ascended scores of mountains throughout the southwest, and the rich experiences of glowing health and vigor, vim, snap, tingle, that come from such exercises, no one can know but those who have enjoyed them. A few weeks ago I came to the Grand Canyon, September 1907, after nearly a year of rest from physical labor, 
on an extended scale. My civilized occupations had preempted all my time. I shall start out on the trail, up and down Havasu Canyon, Bass Trail of the Grand Canyon, and the Grand View and Red Canyon trails. Again and again I walked up the steepest portions for a mile at a time, setting the pace for the horses and mules, and it was a source of mental as well as physical delight that my lungs, heart, and body generally were in such good condition that I could do this day after day for two weeks, not only without exhaustion, but with positive exhilaration and physical delight. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 of What the White Race May Learn from the Indian by George Wharton James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 7 The Indian in the Rain and the Dirt. How these things we may learn from the Indian grow upon us as we study the noble red man in his own haunts. Again and again I have noticed that. He doesn't know enough to go in when it rains. The white man who first coined that expression deemed it an evidence of smartness, and reared his head more proudly than his fellows because he was the author of so bright an idea. Yet when you come to consider it, what a foolish proposition it is. Go in when it rains? Why should you go in? Do the birds go in? I have just been watching them from my study window, larks, linnets, song sparrows, and mockingbirds. Not one of them seems to care a particle about the rain, and their songs are as sweet and as cheery and as full of melody as they are in the days of brightest sunshine. How well I recall seeing a mockingbird on a stand on my lawn one day when the rain was pouring down fiercely. He stood with bill up and tail down so that he had a very gothic roof-like appearance, his mouth wide open, and as the rain poured from the end of his tail, he sent out a flood of melody more rich and sweet than any bird song I ever heard. And the horses! How they enjoy the rain! I have seen them loose in a stable having double doors, the upper of which was open, and when it rained, they would thrust their noses out into the rain and let the drippings of the eaves fall upon them with evident pleasure and longing that they might get out into it all over. Nothing alive in nature save civilized man dreads the rain. The Indian fairly revels in it. I was once at the Avasupai village for a couple of weeks, the guest of my friend Waluthama. His little girl, seven years old, was a perfect little witch. She was quick, nervy, lively, and healthy. When it rained and her clothes got wet, I tried to prevail upon her to come into shelter. But no, she wanted to be out in the rain, and off she sprang through the door, playing with the pools as they collected and running with others of her playmates to where the extemporized waterfalls dashed themselves into semi-spray as they fell from the heights above upon the shelving rocks. Here they stood in the water and rain like dusky fairies, laughing and shouting, romping and sporting in perfect glee. The older women, too, mind it but little, unless it is very cold or the wind is blowing. They no more mind being wet than they do that the wind should blow or the sun shine, and as for any ill effect that either children or grown-ups suffer from the wet, I have yet to see it. Why? The reasons are clear. In the first place, they have no fear of the rain. It is not constantly instilled into their minds from childhood that they mustn't get wet or they'll take cold. And girls are not taught to expect functional disarrangement if their feet get wet. This has something to do with it, 
for the effect of the mind upon the body is far more potent than we yet know. In the second place, they move about with natural activity in the rain as at other times. This keeps the blood circulating and prevents any lowering of the temperature of the body. In the third place, their general out-of-door life gives them such a robustness that if there is any tax upon the system it is fully ready to meet it. But, I am asked, would you advocate white people, especially girls and women, getting wet? Think of their skirts bedraggled in the rain, and how these wet skirts cling to the ankles and make their wearers uncomfortable. I have thought a great deal about this, and am not prepared to say that with our present costume I would advocate women's going out much in the rain, but I do say that once in a while they can put on short skirts and stout shoes and such old clothes as cannot be injured by getting wet, and then resolutely and boldly sally forth into the rain, and the harder it comes down the better if it be warm weather. Then let them learn to enjoy the pattering of the rain upon cheeks and ears. Let them hold out their hands and feel the soft and gentle caress of the high-born noble rain. Let them watch the drops as they spatter on the leaves and trickle down the stems, gathering volume and speed as they reach the bowl and fall to the ground, there to give life and nourishment to the whole plant. Everything in nature loves to be out in the rain. How fresh and bright the trees look after a shower! How the rocks are cleansed and made bright and shining! How their color comes vividly out in the rain! And upon human beings the effect is the same, provided they value health and vigor more than they mind a little discomfort in the bedragglement of their clothes. Years ago I learned this lesson. I was riding from the line of the railway over the painted desert with several Havusapai Indians. It was the rainy season. Showers fell half a dozen times a day. At first I wished I had an umbrella. I got wet through, and so did the Indians. I thought I ought to feel wretched and miserable but somehow the Indians were as bright and cheerful as ever. So I plucked up heart and courage, and in half an hour my clothes were dry again. Four or five times that day, and an equal number the next day, I got wet through and dry again. Riding horseback kept me warm, and the quick and healthful circulation of the blood, the act of deep breathing caused by the exercise, the absence of fear in the soul, all combined to make the wetting a benefit instead of an injury. My friend W. W. Bass of the Grand Canyon of Arizona, with whom I have made many trips in that wonderland region, tells with great gusto a true story of my riding over the desert on one occasion, clothed in one of the old-fashioned linen dusters that reached below my knees. It was warm weather, and dusty on the railway, hence the duster, I suppose. But when we got fairly out on the desert it began to rain, and how it did pour! It came down so rapidly that by and by my pockets were full of water, and Bass says that when he overtook me I was jogging along, singing at the top of my voice, just as the mockingbird did the water splashing out of my pockets as I bounced up and down in the saddle. The linen duster clung to the sides and back of the horse and wrapped itself around my legs, so that the picture was comical in the extreme. But I was happy and refused to feel any discomfort, and so got joy out of the experience, as well as health and vigor. For let it be remembered that when I came from England twenty-five years ago, I came as an invalid, broken down in health completely, so much so that I was even forbidden to read a book for a whole year. Now few men are as healthy as I. 
years of association with the indian learning simplicity and naturalness of him have aided materially in making the change i have learned the value of putting the primary things first i used to be so nice and finicky that the idea of having my clothes wet would give me a small panic they would get out of shape and look badly and have to be pressed before i could wear them again but when i came to the conclusion that i was worth more than clothes that my health was of more importance than a crease in my trousers i found i was taking hold of a principle which while it might at times seem to be rough on my clothing would have a decidedly beneficial influence on myself and this leads to another important lesson we may learn from the indian he is not as nice sometimes as i wish he were but we are far too nice often for health and comfort many a woman ruins her health by wrecking her nerves drives her husband distracted worries and annoys her children by being too nice in her house i have found in new england and elsewhere i even in old england women who valued a clean house more than they valued their own lives the happiness of their children and the comfort of their husbands indeed in one case i well remember a woman drove her husband into temporary insanity and finally into ignominious flight away from her by her eternal washing of floors shaking of carpets polishing of furniture and dusting down every time the poor fellow went in from the workshop he must change his clothes if he came in from the outside he must take off his shoes before he entered the door if he put his warm hand down on the polished table he was rebuked for his wife at once got up fetched her chamois leather and rubbed off the offending marks poor wretched woman and equally poor wretched man no wonder he went crazy and finally lost his manhood and ran away i know this is an extreme case but i vouch for its strict truth and there are thousands of women and men too for that matter who are afflicted in a serious measure with the same disease in that home where niceness is valued more than health and comfort and work in life there lurks serious danger go to the indian and while i do not suggest that you lose all niceness by any means seek to learn some of his philosophy and place primary things first first health happiness comfort peace contentment love then these other things i'm going to make a confession that i am afraid will bring me into sad repute with some of my readers when my first boy was born we were naturally very proud of him as he grew out of his baby clothes we liked to see him look nice and neat and clean he must be a pretty little cherub dressed in white and have the manners of a little lord fauntleroy then i came to the conclusion that we were valuing niceness more than the healthy development of the child i remonstrated and urged a change but to no effect so i resolved on a coup d'etat one morning after the youngster was dressed up in his white bib and tucker and as uncomfortable and unhappy as any and all healthy children feel at such treatment i took him by the hand and led him out of doors and out of sight of all watchful eyes where there was plenty of mud and plenty of water in half an hour his changed appearance was a marvel we started a little stream of water which we then dammed we made mud pies and i helped him mix the dough in his apron we reveled in mud from top to toe i rolled him in it so that back was as vividly marked as front not a remnant of niceness was left in him we went home happy and contented laughing and merry but bedaubed and beplastered everywhere 
We had had such a good time. And it was such fun going out with father. We were going again tomorrow, and the next day, and the next. And so we did. It needed no words, no argument. It did not take long to get two or three suits of brown canvas or blue denim, and the youngster grew up healthy, happy, vigorous, strong, tough, and often dirty, rather than anemic, miserable, dyspeptic, weak and ailing, and nice. There would be far less demand for children's tombstones, surmounted with marble angels and inscribed with wretched doggerel, if mothers valued health rather than niceness, vigor before primness, and strength immaculate rather than bibs and aprons. So, I say, let us not be over-nice, and especially let us not train our children to value clean hands and clothes more than the rugged health that comes from contact with the soil in out-of-door employments. I find one can enjoy Homer and Browning, Dante and Shakespeare, all the better because his body is vigorous and strong, his brain clear, and his mind active as the result of rough-and-tumble mountain climbing, desert tramping or riding, and walking on canyon trails. Another result of this frank and fearless acceptance of out-of-door conditions is manifested in a readiness to meet difficulties that over-niceness is disinclined to touch. Let me illustrate. Two or three months ago I made a journey with two Yuma Indians and four white men down the overflow of the Colorado River to the Salton Sea. We were warned beforehand that it would be an awfully hard trip. We were told that it was hell boiled down to try to go through certain places. The river for ten or twelve miles left its bed and ran wild over a vast tract of land covered with a mesquite forest. Mesquite is a fairly dense tree growth covered with strong and piercing thorns. When we came to this place we had to cut our way through the thorny thicket, and our faces, hands, and bodies all suffered with fierce scratchings and thorn pricks. Several times we stuck fast, and there was nothing for it but to jump out into the water with axe in hand and cut away the obstructions or lift over the boat. My Indian, Jim, though dignified and serene, as I shall fully explain elsewhere, had the promptness that over-niceness destroys. He was out over the side of the boat as quickly as I was, ready for the hard and disagreeable work. Had I been nicely dressed, and nice about the feeling of water up to my middle, too nice to wade for hours, sinking into quicksands, in order to find the best passage for the boats, we should have been there yet. We cut down three mesquite trees, under water, in order to get our boats over the stumps. We forced our way through tall and dense arrow weeds, one in front and the other behind the boat, lifting and forcing, pulling and pushing. It was not nice work, but it was invigorating, stimulating, and soul-developing. The other day I went photographing on the Salton Sea. When the launch stopped twenty-five feet from the island covered with pelicans, where I wished to make photographs, I shouldered my camera, stepped out into the water, which came up to my thighs, and walked ashore. The engineer wondered, why should he? Had I waited, the pelicans would have flown away. Speed was necessary. Niceness would have prevented my getting what I went for. When I stand on the lecture platform, or in the pulpit, or in the drawing room, when I meet ladies in the parlor and go with them for an automobile ride, I dress as neatly as I can afford, and endeavor to look nice. But when I go into my garden to work, I put on blue overalls, a flannel shirt, and a pair of heavy shoes 
and I try not to be nice. I roll around in the dirt, I feel it with my hands, I revel in it, for thus, I find, do I gain healthful enjoyment for body, mind, and soul. I owe many things to the Indian, but few things I am more grateful for than that he taught me how to value important things more than looking neat and being nice. End of chapter 7Chapter 8 of What the White Race May Learn from the Indian by George Wharton James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 8 The Indian and Physical Labor. Ministers and orators, teachers and statesmen, members of the WCTU as well as the YMCA, of the White Race, all profess to believe that the white race believes in the dignity of physical labor. That profession is often a lie. We no more believe in the dignity of physical labor than we do in the refinement of a hog. Our actions give the direct lie to our words. I am writing with the utmost calmness, and say these strong words with deliberate intent. As a nation, we are humbugs when we pretend to believe in the dignity of labor. Perhaps, after all, we do believe in it, but in most cases it is not for ourselves, but for the other fellow. On the other hand, the Indian really and truly believes in the dignity of physical labor. A chief would just as soon be caught dressing buckskin or sewing a pair of moccasins or irrigating his cornfield, as lolling on a Navajo blanket smoking the pipe of peace. With the white race this is not so. Men believe in the dignity of labor as much as they do in the brotherhood of man. They would no more be seen doing physical labor, wheeling a wheelbarrow, for instance, digging a ditch, building a wall, plowing a potato patch, or doing any other physical work, save the few things men are allowed to do without being thought peculiar, as, for instance, taking care of a small home garden, taking the ashes out of the furnace, and things of that kind, than they would be seen picking their neighbors' pockets or burglarizing their houses. When they want to gain exercise, they go to some indoor gymnasium where the air is the breathed-over dead air of a hundred people, and they swing dumbbells, pull on weights, struggle frantically on bars, and do other similar and fool-like things, because, forsooth, these things are gentlemanly. Or they go out and swing golf clubs and pursue a poor innocent little ball over the links while gaping caddies look on at their wild strokes and listen to the insane profanity with which they try to compel themselves to believe that they are gentlemen ba jove of all the contemptible shuffling and mean subterfuges the white race is capable of this seems to me to be about the meanest and most contemptible to pretend to believe in the dignity of labor and then at any and all opportunities afforded to labor to dodge away and do these useless and selfish things that do not take off one ounce of the burden of physical labor we have imposed upon our fellows let me not be thought for a moment to be opposed to any healthful recreation or sport if golf be pursued as a recreation for fun i am heartily in accord with it and its promoters it is when it is taken as an exercise, as a substitute for honest and useful labor, that I protest against it as a fraud, a delusion, a snare, and a contemptible subterfuge. If you want real exercise, real work, go and relieve some poor fellow man of his excess of hard work. Tell him you have come to give him an hour's rest, that he may go and study nature, go and look at the flowers of your garden, 
wander into the woods and hear the birds sing, or visit the public library and read some entertaining and instructive book. If you are too ashamed to openly try to give an hour or two of rest and change to your brother man, go and chop the wood for the house, dig up the potato patch, wheel out the manure from the stable, or do some other useful and beneficial thing. Pleasure is pleasure, sport is sport, fun is fun. But to engage in these sports seriously, as a physical exercise to counteract the effects of your evil dietetic habits, or other grossnesses, is to add hypocrisy and subterfuge to evil living. What labor the Indian has to do, he does gladly, cheerfully, openly. He is not ashamed to have soiled hands, or to be caught in the act. In this I am heartily in accord with him. If I ever wrote a creed, one of the first articles of my religion would be, I believe in the benefit and joy of physical labor. If I had my way, I would compel every member of the so-called learned professions, from preacher to lawyer, teacher and doctor, statesman, politician and bartender, to spend not less than three hours at hard physical labor every day. And as for my brother preachers, I would put them to road-making every Monday, for half the day at least, so that by practical knowledge of road-making on earth they might be better able to preach to their congregations the following Sunday about the road to heaven. There is nothing that more reveals that we are a people of caste and class than the attitude of the rich and the learned toward physical labor. I am not in sympathy with that attitude in any respect. I despise, hate, loathe it, and would see it changed. To the Indian, for his honest respect for and indulgence in physical labor, I give my adherence and honor. End of chapter 8Chapter 9 of What the White Race May Learn from the Indian by George Wharton James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 9 The Indian and Physical Labor for Girls and Women. In the preceding chapter, I have given the Indian's life, habit, thought towards physical labor for himself and his sons. He holds the same attitude toward it for his daughter and his wife. And not only does he so hold it, but the wife and daughter regard it in exactly the same way. The outdoor life of the Indian girl and woman makes her healthy, vigorous, muscular, and strong. She glories in her physical vigor and strength, and wonders why her white sister is not equal to her in physical capacity. When I tell her that the white women pity her because, forsooth, she has to do so much hard work while the lazy men sit by, smoking and doing nothing, she looks at me in vacant amazement. Once when I was talking in this way, one of them said, Are your white women all fools? Tell them we not only don't need their pity, but we despise them for their habits of life that lead them to pity us. The Creator made us with the capacity and power for work. He knows that all beings must work if they would be healthy. We would be healthy, and therefore we do His will in working at our appointed tasks. We are glad and proud to do them. And as for the men, let them dare to interfere in our work, and they will soon see what they will see. We brook no interference or help from them. So their children, girls as well as boys, are all brought up from the earliest years to work, and to work hard. Boys are sent out to herd sheep, horses, and cattle, to watch the corn and see that nothing disturbs it. And the girls, as soon as they can toddle, become little mothers to their younger brothers and sisters. 
as they grow older they grind all the corn gather all the wild grass and other seeds make all the basketry and pottery and prepare all the food for the household to grind corn in the indian fashion with flat rock and matati is no easy task for a strong man in the white race yet i have known a girl of fifteen to keep at work at the matate for ten hours a day for several days in succession in order that there might be plenty of flour when guests came to the snake dance on one of my visits to the hopi village of oraibi i found the women at work building a house this is their occupation all labor among hopis is divided between the sexes in accordance with long-established custom and i think it is so divided in all aboriginal peoples the men undertook the protection of the home were the warriors and the hunting of animals for food they also make the robes and moccasins those tribes that lost their nomad character and became sedentary added care of the fields and the stock to the work of their men the women practically undertook all the rest the building of the home its care the general gathering of seeds and the preparation of all foods belong to them and as a rule they do their chosen or appointed or hereditary work cheerfully they know nothing of the aches and pains of their weaker white sisters they are as strong as men so they have no fear of physical labor not only this but they enjoy it they go to it with pleasure as all healthy bodies do how often have i stood and watched a healthy vigorous man swing a hammer at the forge or in a mine or a trench how easily it was done how gladly how unconscious of effort to the healthy woman with reasonable strength labor is also a pleasure to feel oneself accomplishing something and able to do it without undue fatigue or exhaustion what a delight it is the woman who honors us by coming to our house weekly to do the heavy work often reminds me of a panther she fairly leaps upon her work with an exuberance of strength and spirit that is a perfect delight in this age of woman's physical disability and disinclination to do physical labor so it is with indian women they sing in unison when a dozen of them get together at the grinding trough though the work is hard enough when long continued to exhaust any strong man i have seen women kneel and pound acorns all day lifting a heavy pestle as high as their heads at every stroke in the case of these women builders at orabi they carried all the heavy rocks and put them in position mixed their own mortar and were their own patties and in everything save the placing of the heavy crossbeams for the roof to handle which they called upon some of the men for aid they did all the work from beginning to end now while i do not especially want to see white women building a house i do wish with all my heart that they had the physical strength to do it or similar arduous labor i do long for the whole of my race that the women and girls shall have such vigorous health and strength that no ordinary labor could tire them but say my white friends women and girls we don't want to work physically there is no need for it we are not strong enough to do it we exhaust ourselves and then do not have energy enough for the other duties of life we engage servants to do our menial labor for us indeed in the first place i want to protest with all the power i have against the word and idea menial there is no menial service all service rendered in willing helpfulness and love is dignified noble and ennobling 
he or she who accepts service from another with the idea that the service is menial thereby degrades himself herself far more than the person is degraded by the performance of the service i would rather have my son a good scavenger working daily to keep the city pure and clean than be an honored lawyer engaging in dishonest cases a successful politician tangled up with graft a popular physician selfishly deceiving his patients or an eloquent and dear minister self-righteously lauding himself and pouring forth inane platitudes in high-sounding phrases from the pulpit menial service is divine compared with these occupations when they are demoralized and the principle of all i have said applies to girls as well as boys i would rather that daughters of mine should be able to scrub the floor bake bread do the family washing and mending repair the boys clothes knit sew and take care of the kitchen garden and the flowers than strum the battle of prague or the maiden's prayer without feeling or expression on a half-tuned piano the former occupations are holy and dignified as compared with the sham exhibition of the latter i like to see a girl with an apron on strong healthy willing useful capable engaged in useful household work and if our young men had one-tenth part of the sense they ought to have they would hunt for such girls to become their wives and the mothers of their children rather than for the dainty white-faced wasp-waisted finger manicured dolls who are useful for no other purpose than to be looked at i have no desire to make pack-horses or slaves of intelligent women or girls but i cannot help asking the question of them which would you rather be strong enough to do any and all so-called menial and laborious service and endowed with perfect health or be weakly and puny and live the life of ease and luxury that most women and girls seem to cover and upon the answer to that question should i base my judgment as to the wisdom intelligence and fitness for the duties of life of the answerer there is no dignity in woman superior to the dignity of being able personally if necessary to care for all the physical needs of her household there is no charm greater than the charm of strength combined with gracious womanly sweetness exercised for the joy of others there is no refinement greater than the refinement of a gloriously healthy woman radiating physical mental spiritual life upon all those who come within the sphere of her influence end of chapter nine chapter ten of what the white race may learn from the indian by george wharton james this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Ten, The Indian and Diet. A man is largely the result of what he eats. Indeed, many scientific specialists now tell us that sex determination is largely the result of the food eaten by the expectant mother, so that according to what the mother eats, the unborn child becomes male or female. Ploss, in his well-known Über die das Geschlechtverhältnis der Kinder bedingenden Ursachen, Dusing, in his painstaking Die Regulierung des Geschlechtverhältnisses bei der Vernierung der Menschen, Tiere und Pflanzen, and Westermark, in The History of Human Marriage, prove conclusively, from close study of actual experimentation, that the sex of the child is largely fixed by the quantity and quality of nutrition absorbed by the mother hence it is not too strong a statement that a man is largely the result of his or his mother's 
food. At first sight it will appear foolish to many of my readers to go to the Indian for ideas on diet, yet I think I can prove, more conclusively than the learned scientists whose books I have named above can prove their theories, that the Indian has many ideas on diet which the white race can learn to its great advantage. In the first place, the normal aborigine, before he began to use the white man's foods, was perforce compelled to live on a comparatively simple diet. His choice was limited, his cookery simple, yet he lived in perfect health and strength. With few articles of diet, and these of the simplest character, prepared in the readiest and easiest ways, he attained a vigor, a robustness, that puts to shame the strength and power of civilized men. Why? The reasons are not far to seek. In simplicity of food there is safety. We eat not only too much, but too great variety, and every student of dietetics knows that the greater the variety, the greater the possibility that too much will be eaten. The Indian, living his simple life, was compelled to be content with the maize, beans, pumpkins, and melons of his fields, the peaches of his orchards, the wild grass seeds, nuts, fruits, and roots he or his squaw could gather, and the products of his traps or the chase. Here, then, was a restricted dietary. He had not much choice, nor a large menu for each meal. The smaller the menu, the less, as a rule, any person will eat, be he Indian or white man. The extended menu is a series of temptations to overeat. The simple menu of the Indian was a preventive to gluttony. It will doubtless be recalled that when the great Bismarck was broken down in health, his physicians gave him no other prescription as to food than that he should eat but one kind of food to a meal. This is a dietetic axiom. The less variety, the less one eats. In a diseased condition, health can often be restored by giving the stomach and assimilative organs less work to do. Among the Indian race, dyspepsia is almost unknown. To this fact that they have a small variety of foods, this healthful condition is largely attributable. On the other hand, one has but to pick up any daily newspaper to see the positive proofs of the dyspeptic condition of the greatest nation in the world among the white race. There are nostrums for dyspepsia without end. Syrups pills, doses that work while you sleep, and dope that works inside and out. Millions of dollars are annually spent merely in advertising these damnable proofs of our idiocy, or gluttony, or both. A thousand nostrums flout their damned and damning lies in the faces of the superior race, and a drug store on every corner of our large cities demonstrates the great demand there is for these absolute proofs of our vile dietetic habits. Every pill taken, every nostrum swallowed, is a proof positive of our ignorance, or our gluttony, or our gullibility, and probably a good deal of each. Seventy-five millions of dollars were spent in 1905 in the purchase of patent medicines, every cent of which was worse than wasted. Before the white race came and perverted, pardon me, civilized, him, what did the uncivilized Indian know of patent medicines? What did he know of the diseases which these nostrums are supposed to cure? Nothing. He was as ignorant of one as the other. In his native wildness, he was healthy and strong. Only since he has been led into evil ways by a false civilization has he so degenerated as to need such compounds? Let us then forget our civilization, this portion of it, and forego our physical ills and our patent nostrums, 
and go back to a simple, natural, restricted diet. In that, one course of procedure will be found more restored health than all the physicians of the world can give otherwise in a score of years. Let us learn to eat few things to a meal, and those of such a nature that they will properly mix, and thus not overtax the stomach in its work of digestion. When I sit down to the laden tables of my rich friends, or at the tables of the first-class hotels of the country, I sometimes find my judgment stronger than my perverted appetite. At such times I look over the bill of fare. I see ten or a dozen courses, varying from cocktails, oysters, and fish, to ice cream, fruit, and wines. There are meats and vegetables, nuts and fruits, cooked and uncooked, pastries and jellies, soups and coffee, wines and spices, sauces, relishes, and seasonings galore, and I am more or less disgusted with the whole business, and eat sparingly of but two or three dishes. At other times, alas, my appetite asserts itself, and I go the pace with the rest. Now, when all these things, so elaborately prepared, so daintily served, so nicely eaten, are disposed of and in the stomach, let me ask, without any desire to offend, is there the slightest difference in the contents of the stomach of such a person and the stomach of a hog filled with swill? In the first case there is cocktail and caviar, olives and celery, oysters and soup, fish and entremet, entree and roast, game and punch, ice cream and cheese, pastry and fruit, nuts and crackers, with water, coffee, tea, or wine, to liquefy it all, all taken separately, but now mixed in one horrible mess within, and in the case of the hog, they were mixed first and swallowed mixed, instead of in courses. Oh, men and women of the white race, of the superior civilization, quit such gluttony and disease-breeding courses. Get back to the Indian simplicity in diet. Learn the meaning of low living and high thinking. Stop pampering your sensual appetites and feeding your stomachs at the expense of your minds, aye, and at the expense of your souls. For men and women who thus live continuously generally become selfish, indifferent to the sufferings of others, proud-stomached, which means much more than it seems to mean, and incapable of the finer feelings. Nor is this all that the Indian may teach us as to diet. When at times he eats everything he can lay his hands upon, and also eats ravenously, in his normal condition he eats slowly and masticates thoroughly. Since Horace Fletcher wrote his most interesting and useful books on diet and life, the term Fletcherizing has become almost universal amongst thoughtful people to express mastication to the point of liquefaction. But I was familiar with Fletcherizing before I had ever heard of Mr. Fletcher. The Indians, with their parched corn, had taught me years before the benefit of thorough and complete mastication. I had gone off with a band of Indians on a hard week's ride with no other food than parched corn and a few raisins. This was chewed and chewed and chewed by the hour, a handful of the grain making an excellent meal, and thoroughly nourishing the perfect bodies of these stalwart athletes who never knew an ache or a pain, and who could withstand fatigue and hardship without a thought. A marked and wonderful effect of thorough mastication is that it decreases the appetite from ten to fifteen per cent, and reduces the desire for flesh meat from thirty to fifty per cent. The more we masticate, the less we desire to eat, and the more normal our appetites become. This in itself is a thing to be desired, for it is far easier not to have an abnormal appetite 
than it is to control it when it has fastened itself upon us then too while indians will often eat to repletion and at their feasts indulge in disgusting gorging they do know how to fast with calmness and equanimity i am not prepared to say that they will fast voluntarily except in the cases of those neophytes who are seeking some unusual powers or gifts from those above yet i do know that several times i have been with them when fasting was obligatory because of the scarcity of food and they accepted the condition without a murmur i know a very prominent physician in san francisco who has an extensive practice who pumps the food out of the stomachs of several of his gluttonous patients after their hearty french dinners he defends his course of procedure by saying that his patients would not listen to him if he counseled fasting for even one meal yet they are willing to allow him to remove the food after it is eaten and to swallow some harmless dope that he gives them because that is easy and requires no self-control i know the power of appetite i know how hard it is to eat only that which the reason tells us is best i know how hard it is to eat slowly and thoroughly masticate the food but i also know that these things are imperative if one would have perfect health therefore in spite of many lapses into the old habits i persist in asserting the good over the evil and in teaching the good to others in the hope that in my own case the good course will become the easiest to follow and in the case of the young who listen to me they may learn the best way before they have fallen into the evil way there is one other thing the white race might learn from the indian and that is that the habitual use of flesh is not essential to health when captain cook visited the maoris of new zealand he found them a perfectly healthy people and he states that he never observed a single person who appeared to have any bodily complaint nor among the number that were seen naked was once perceived the slightest eruption of the skin nor the least mark which indicated that such eruptions had formerly existed as dr cress says another proof of the health of these people was the readiness with which wounds that at any time received healed up in a man who has been shot with a musket ball through the fleshy part of the arm his wound seemed well digested and in so fair a way to be healed says the captain that if i had not known that no application had been made to it i should have inquired with very interesting curiosity after the vulnerary herbs and surgical art of the country an additional evidence of the healthiness of the new zealanders he says is in the great number of old men found among them many of them appeared to be very ancient and yet none of them were decrepit although they were not equal to the young in muscular strength they did not come in the least behind them in regard to cheerfulness and vivacity at the advent of captain cook the maoris were practically vegetarians they had no domestic or wild animals on the islands hence could not have been flesh eaters while our indians of the southwest will eat some forms of flesh at times they are generally speaking vegetarians the navajos scarcely ever eat meat while in their primitive condition and they are proud independent high-spirited vigorous healthy and strong so with the havasupai and wallapai and most of the aborigines of this region the apaches are also largely vegetarians and yet are known as a fierce and warlike people they are fierce when aroused but when friendly are kindly disposed honest reliable and good workers strong athletic vigorous and healthy these facts demonstrate that flesh meat is not necessary 
Meat is another fetish of the civilization of the white race, before which we bow down in ignorant worship. The world would be far better off, in my judgment, and as the result of my observation and experience, if we ate no flesh at all. Personally, I am never so well physically and my brain so active as when I live the vegetarian life, though when I am at the tables of meat-eaters I eat whatever comes and make the best of it. The experiences of thousands of healthy and vigorous white men demonstrate that meat is not necessary to the highest development. Weston, the great pedestrian, is both a teetotaler and vegetarian. Bernard McFadden and several of his muscular helpers are practical vegetarians, and athletes, businessmen, lawyers, judges, doctors, clergymen, and many others testify to the beneficial effects of the vegetarian diet. There is no man in the civilized world today that works as hard and as continuously, physically as well as mentally, as Dr. J. H. Kellogg of the Battle Creek Sanitarium. He is a rigid vegetarian, and seldom eats more than one meal a day. Yet he works from sixteen to twenty hours daily, edits two magazines, writes continually for scientific magazines and periodicals, attends to vast correspondence, is the business head of the greatest sanitarium in the world, consults annually with thousands of patients, and keeps daily watch of their condition, gives numberless lectures, is always experimenting on foods and surgical appliances, and inventing new instruments and methods for curing disease, and at the same time performs more surgical operations, perhaps with less fatal results, than any other surgeon in the country. Besides this, he is the president of the medical college, and a lecturer to the students, and gives many lectures to the medical missionary classes, and withal finds time and strength to confer with, direct the education of, and give personal love to the ten or fifteen children he has adopted into his home and made his own. Here is an additional item which adds strength to what I have written. The attention of medical men has recently been called to the case of Gustave Nordin, a hardy Swede, who paddled his own canoe from Stockholm to Paris, reaching there in robust health after the long voyage, during which he lived on apples, milk, water, and bread. The New York Herald states, that this dangerous and arduous voyage was undertaken by the Swede to show what could be done by a man who has given up meat, tea, coffee, wine, beer, spirits, and tobacco. He prides himself in eclipsing those vegetarians who continue the use of tea and condiments. When in America, at the age of eighteen, Nordeen was suffering so from dyspepsia that he could not take ordinary food. He therefore began a diet of fruit, principally apples, whereby he attained to his present robust condition of health. So, meat-eating, alcohol-liquor, drinking white race, cast aside your high-headedness and pride, your dietetic errors and ill health, at one and the same time, and go and learn of the Indian simplicity of diet, wise limitation of your dietary, careful and thorough mastication, and abstention from all flesh foods. End of chapter 10「Chapter Eleven of What the White Race May Learn from the Indian by George Wharton James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 11 The Indian and Education Take it all in all, I think I believe more in the Indian system of education than our own, I mean in the principles involved. 
our education is largely an education of books we teach from books we study from books we get our ideas from books joaquin miller's reply to elbert hubbard before quoted seems to many people to be a foolish remark but i see a profound thought in it it was the poet's protest against the too great use of books he regards books as subversive of individual thought he contends that books retard and prevent thought and that we read not to stimulate thought but to deaden it and undoubtedly too much reading and dependence upon books does deaden and destroy not only thought but alas far worse still the power to indulge in individual thought hence books are often a hindrance and a curse instead of a help and a blessing the indian has no books while he has tradition and legend myth and story he has no written word everything that is as differentiated from everything that is supposed in his life has to be personally learned by individual contact with the things themselves botany is the study of flowers not of words about flowers there is but one way we can really study botany and that is out in the fields with the flower growing before us it must be seen day in and day out from its planting until its fruition all its development must be known and understood the properties of its fruit its roots its stem its leaves for food medicinal manufacturing or other purposes are all connected with the study it is well to know the names of the plants the names of all parts of plants and the families and species to which they belong but these latter things important and interesting though they be are but secondary or tertiary as compared with the primary outdoor personal and intimate knowledge i have referred to those who think the indian uneducated should read charles eastman's oyesa book telling of his boyhood days with his sioux parents and grandparents eastman is a full-blooded sioux and though later educated at dartmouth college still shows by his writings and words how much he reveres his wise teachers of the open air and the woods the fact is that in matters pertaining to personal observation the indian children are far ahead of our own brightest and smartest children they observe the slightest deviations from the regular order who does not know of the indian's power in trailing i know navajos mojaves hopis havasupais and others who will follow the dimmest trail with unerring certainty and tell you the details of the actions of the person or animal trailed this is education of a wonderfully useful kind a kind that it would be well to give more of to our own children indeed i have been saying both privately and publicly for many years and i here repeat it that if my children were trained to observe and reflect upon what they observed i should not care if they never went to school until they were grown up to young manhood and womanhood that keen though unusual thinker ernest crosby in one of his books presented the following which perfectly meets my ideas and suggests what i mean in regard to the indian education here are two educated men the one has a smattering of latin and greek the other knows the speech and habits of horses and cattle and gives them their food in due season the one is acquainted with the roots of nouns and verbs the other can tell you how to plant and dig potatoes and carrots and turnips the one drums by the hour on the piano making it a terror to the neighborhood the other is an expert at the reaper and binder which fills the world with good cheer the one knows or has forgotten the higher trigonometry and the differential calculus 
the other can calculate the bushels of rye standing in his field and the number of barrels to buy for the apples on the trees in his orchard the one understands the chemical affinities of various poisonous acids and alkalis the other can make a savory soup or a delectable pudding the one sketches a landscape indifferently the other can shingle his roof and build a shed for himself in a workmanlike manner the one has heard of plato and aristotle and kant and comte but knows precious little about them the other has never been troubled by such knowledge but he will learn the first and last words of philosophy to love far quicker i warrant you than his college-bred neighbor for still it is true that god hath hidden these things from the wise and prudent and revealed them unto babes such are two educations which is the higher and which the lower i would not have it thought that i am opposed to all systematic and book education even on our present plan or under our present system my protest is not so wide and sweeping as that the main propositions upon which i base my opposition are one that we do not pay sufficient attention to the physical health of our students making health of secondary tertiary or quaternary importance or often not giving it a single thought leaving it absolutely to regulate itself when it should be the first primary determinate aim and object of all education this very day upon which i write i sat at a professor's table he is a prominent educator in one of the important cities of the west we were eating breakfast he was complaining of indigestion as he ate i could see his tongue seamed and coated and his lips were rough and fevered as with stomach trouble he helped himself to mush four times as much as a healthy man ought to have taken and in far less time than it has taken me to write this he had shoveled it all in and gobbled it down the words in quotation marks shoveled and gobbled are used thoughtfully and they more truthfully described what was the absolute fact than any other words with which i am familiar he drank two glasses of milk warm from the cow and ate french bread which had been heated in the oven and then saturated with butter the night before he had opened a can of sardines as he said to see what he could eat and after the mush he ate a few of them then the maid brought in bacon and fried eggs and coffee and he did justice to them yet he wondered why he was troubled with indigestion and his poor wife sent word down from her bedroom that she regretted she could not see me again as she was suffering severely with one of her regular sick headaches my own breakfast consisted of a small quota of mush some of the hot bread there was no other and some cold milk i felt well and happy after my frugal meal while he confessed not only to feeling heavy and logy but unsatisfied with what he had eaten a clear proof of an abnormal appetite and a disordered digestive system now it is to be expected that with our teachers themselves so ignorant of the first principles of healthy dietetics our students should know any better our whole system of eating is wrong we eat anything and everything our tastes often perverted and depraved demand and we never ask ourselves the question as to whether the food is good or our methods of eating it wise and proper in my chapter on the indian and diet i discuss this question more thoroughly but i refer to it in this connection as one of the great defects of our educational system two my second proposition is that we keep our students indoors all the time as a settled established custom with occasional short periods out of doors instead of reversing the matter and keeping them out of doors all the time 
with occasional short periods indoors. Why keep children or university students indoors? While in the winter climate of the East outdoor life is not as possible as it is in the balmy West, there certainly can be much more time spent out of doors than there now is. We pride ourselves upon our scholastic progressiveness, yet they do these things far better in Germany. The educational and medical authorities of Berlin have organized a forest school for the city children of the crowded districts of Berlin and Charlottenburg. In a wide clearing, a hundred and fifty children follow, out of doors, the usual procedure of school, delightfully varied with nature study at first hand. The hours of work are short, and fresh air and exercise are given at supreme importance. The children cook their own dinners at a campfire, and their desks and seats and shelter sheds were made from the timber felled to form the clearing. At one o'clock they are all required to take an hour's nap, for which each child is provided with a blanket and a reclining chair. This is a move in the right direction. Our schools cost the nation millions of dollars each year. Surely we have a right to demand that they give us health for our children in exchange, instead of ruining it in so many cases, as they do now. In Japan, out-of-door schools are quite common, especially when the cherry and plum trees are in blossom. In Los Angeles, California, a business college holds many of its class sessions out-of-doors, and I trust the time will come when this will be the rule in all schools, instead of the exception. I am perfectly well aware that there is danger that these statements will be taken too literally. They must be taken as broad and general statements. My conception is that, in our present condition, we live indoors and go out of doors occasionally. I would have that proposition reversed. We should live out of doors and go indoors occasionally. The same common sense and rational mode of reading my words must be applied to all that I say on out of door education. Naturally, I am not such a fool as to suppose that all educational or scientific or any other work can be done out of doors. Though I am not a college professor and never shall be, though I am not a scientific expert, and never can be, though I am not many things that other men are, I know enough, have observed and seen enough, to know that delicate experiments of a variety of kinds need the most rigid indoor seclusion for their successful conducting. But this does not alter my general propositions, viz., that the health of students is of more importance than any and all education given in schools or colleges, that outdoor life is more conducive to the health of students than indoor life, and that, therefore, where possible, all education should be given out of doors. 3. As a result of this indoor scholastic life, we content ourselves by teaching our children from books, which at best are but embalmed knowledge, canned information, the dry bones of knowledge, words about things, instead of bringing them in contact, as far as is possible and practicable, with the things themselves. I believe in books. I believe in education. I believe in schools, in colleges, in universities in teachers, professors, and doctors of learning. But I do not believe in them as most of the white race seem to do, viz., as good in themselves. They are good only as they are instruments for good to the children committed to their care. The proper education of one child is worth more to the world than all the schools, colleges, and universities that were ever built. One Michael Angelo one Savonarola, one Francis of Assisi, one Luther, 
one Agassiz, one Audubon, is worth more to the world than all the schools that ever were or ever will be. And if, by our present imperfect and unhealthful school methods, we kill off in childhood one such great soul, we do the human race irreparable injury. Let us relegate the school to its right place, and that is secondary to its primary, the child. The school exists for the child, not the child for the school. As it now is, we put the plastic material of which our nation is to be formed into the mold of our schools, and regardless of consequences, indifferent to the personal equation of each child, overlooking all individuality and personality, the machine works on, stamping this soul and mind material with one same stamp, molding it in one same mold, hardening it in the fire to one same pattern, so that it comes forth just as bricks come forth from a furnace, uniform, regular, alike, perhaps pretty to the unseeing eye, but ruined, spoiled, damned, as far as active, personal, individualistic life and work are concerned. The only human bricks that ever amount to anything when our educational mill has turned them out are those made of refractory clay, the incomplete ones, the broken ones, the twisted ones, those that would not or could not be molded into the established pattern. This is why I am so opposed to our present methods. Let us have fewer lessons from books and more knowledge gained by personal observation. Less reading and cramming and more reflective thinking. Fewer pages of book read and more results and deductions gained from the personal experiences with things high and low, animate and inanimate, that catch the eye and mind out of doors. And above all, the total cessation of all mental labor when the body is not at its best. The crowding of sick and ailing children is more cruel and brutal than Herod's slaughter of the innocents, and so utterly needless and useless that fools couldn't do worse. What is the use of education to a sick person, and especially when the sickness is the result of the educational process? God save us from any more such education. Doubtless I shall be told that my ideas are impracticable. I know they are, and ever will be to those who value the system more than the child. Granted that in cold and wet weather students can't get out of doors much. Then open all the doors and all the windows, and give up the time to marching, to physical exercises, to deep breathing, to anything, romping even, rather than to cramming and studying a set number of pages, while the air breathed is impure, unwholesome, actively poisonous. When our educational methods thus interfere with the health of the child, I am forever and unalterably opposed to them. We had far rather have a nation of healthy and happy children growing up into healthy and happy manhood and womanhood, even though devoid of much book knowledge, than a bloodless, anemic, unhappy nation, though filled with all the lore of the ages. Give me, for me and mine, every time, physical and mental health and happiness, even though we have never parsed a single sentence, determined the family and Latin name of a single flower, or found out the solution of one solitary problem of algebra. 4. My fourth proposition is that as the result of this indoor book teaching, our children are not taught to think for themselves, but are expected and required to accept the ideas of the authors. Often, indeed, they must memorize the exact words of the books. This is, in itself, enough to condemn the whole system. We could better afford to have absolutely no schools, no colleges, no books even, 
than a nation professedly educated, yet the members of which have not learned to do their own thinking. 5. As a conclusion, therefore, I am forced to recognize that, in a much larger measure than we are ready to admit, our educational system is superficial, is a cramming process instead of a drawing out, edicera educational process, and no education so called can be really effective, really helpful, that thus inverts the natural requirements of the mind and that when our system ignores the physical health of the student no matter what his age it is a criminal a wicked a wasteful system that had better speedily be reformed or abolished all these ideas are practically the result of my association with the indian and watching his methods of instruction his life and that of his family out of doors color all that he and they learn I think it was John Brisbane Walker who once wrote a story, when he edited and owned the Cosmopolitan, about some college men, thoroughly educated in the academic sense, who were shipwrecked at sea. He showed the helplessness and hopelessness of their case because of their inability to take hold and do things. The Indian can turn his hand to anything. When out of doors, few things can faze him. He knows how to build a fire in the rain, where to sleep in a storm, how to track a runaway animal, how to trap fish, flesh, or fowl, where to look for seeds, nuts, berries, or roots, how to hobble a horse when he has no rope, that is, how to make a rope from cactus thongs, how to pick at a horse where there is no tree, bush, fence, boulder, nor anything to which to tie it. What college man knows how to picket a horse to a hole in the ground? Yet I have seen an Indian do it, and have done it myself several times. He knows how to find water when there is none in sight, and the educated white man is perishing for want of it, and he knows a thousand and one things that a white man never knows. As I shall show in the chapter on the Indian and art work, the Indian basket weaver far surpasses the white woman of college education in invention of art form, artistic design, variety of stitch or weave, color harmonies and digital dexterity, or ability to compel the fingers and hands to obey the dictates of the brain education is by no means a matter of book learning it is a discipline of the eye the hand the muscles the nerves the whole body to obey the dictates of the highest judgment to the end that the best life the happiest the healthiest and the most useful may be attained and if this definition be at all a true one i am fully satisfied that if we injected into our methods of civilized education a solution of three-fifths of Indian methods, we should give to our race an immeasurably greater happiness, greater health, and greater usefulness. End of chapter 11